Yeah, I mean, we had a chip on our shoulder. We saw the, the picks, the 25 players to watch, no prep, nowhere to be seen. Uh, we, we had some group, and we did that. Oh yeah, we, we most definitely did. We held the chip on our shoulder the whole time, the whole week. It means a lot. And I took this game very personal because, like, I didn't play in two years. I took it very personal and I loved it. I loved the game. They responded. They responded. They grew up tonight on the field, which is great. And um, when you think about it, when you only have, like, maybe three or four kids that have played varsity football before, to get as many people contributing like that tonight and showing the resiliency that they did, that I'm most proud of. I really am. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Getting the business right off the bat. Look at this. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the Meat Grinder, your weekly dose of high school football in Connecticut. I'm your host, Sean Patrick Bowley, and here is Peter Braguaga. And uh, man, Fairfield Prep letting us have it early. <laughs> We're getting off to a roaring start in this. Oh, in this you heard them at the top of the show. That was uh, Captain Ryan O'Connell and uh, Timane Tim Smith just letting us have it about. We were we had nobody in the top ten. We had nobody, you know, nobody in the twenty-five players to watch. Fairfield Prep playing with a chip on its shoulder, you know, and uh, Keith Elstern has he should be a very proud Keith Elstern uh, about his team's twenty-nine to sixteen victory over number three hand and. As we predicted, Fairfield Prep is uh, now, well, as we predict, as we thought, Fairfield Prep now jumping into the top 10, which we'll get to in a second. A little bit later, welcome to the meet ground. A little bit later, we're going to have Hartford public coach Harry Bellucci, the longtime coach here, announced he's going to be retiring, and uh, his team got off to a great start to start week one. We'll talk to him about that, his great career a little bit later. But Pete, man, it was a rough start for us getting back to football, huh? Yeah, but I don't think I'd want it any other way. Uh, when I was, you know, up in Southern Ken, I'm looking on Twitter and I'm seeing Fairfield Prep is just dominating hand just by the score. And I was like, pray, pray, pray for our Instagram messages. Pray for them because we're about to get flooded with ha 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 game time CT, laughing emoji, crying face emoji. Um, and I mean, do we want it any other way? I mean, that's that's what it's about. That was, that was fun. I, I mean, it was fun for everyone, but hand, but yeah. you know, I, I, you know, the Fairfield prep, you know, students, the football players they had fun with it. Uh, we obviously have fun with it. You know, I don't mind poking fun at myself at the, at the expense of myself, but I mean, that's what it's about. I, it was like a, a sense of normalcy. It was really great. You know, we, our, our buddies there at the, uh, at the, at, at Rafferty Stadium, our buddies from the Bomb Squad there were uh, were letting us have it too. You know, I should include some of their comments in there as well. It, uh, there they are, right there, and uh, you know they were they were they had a, it was great. They showed up. Fairfield Preps Bomb Squad shows up in their in their safari uniforms with a with a severed <laughs> tiger head, and, and Steve Philbone, the great Steve Philbone, the hand coach, comes walking out to me and says, "Is that the best they could do?" And I look. Steve, I go, what are you talking about? They did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he was trying to not be intimidated by it. Oh, he's like, is that the best? I've seen worse. Than, I've seen better than that. I'm, I'm he might have, but is my in my travels, they all coming out in safari outfits. They all look like, you know, I can't even think of good for safari guys. Like, you know, what I mean? wild like, thornberries. Yeah. <laughs> but they had, I don't know where they got a head, a tiger head from. Um, I thought it was very funny. Um, prep. Obviously took the preseason rankings to heart and, you know, they came up and showed up, you know, let's, 
let's talk about that game quick. I mean, that's the game I went to. And I, let me just tell you, Pete, how excited and, and like nervous I was about this whole weekend. The first weekend you went to see the night, the Sony game the night before. Yep. And I don't know if you got, I mean, maybe it was the, the atmosphere at this place. It got my butter. It got a lot of butterflies, Pete. Yeah, I was, I was nervous. Um, like, you know, I got to municipal and, it was raining. It was Ansonia will be. There may have been more media members than there were people in the stands uh, for that game. But, you know, the rain doesn't help. Wasn't the greatest matchup, but I was like nervous. I'm like, do I know how to like shoot football anymore? Like, do yeah. I know to stand in the right spot? Am I going to stand too close? Am I going to get run over? Uh, do I still know how to do this? It was very, very, very nerve wracking, yeah. to be honest. And and then once the kickoff happened and I shot a couple of plays, I, I got a little bit more comfortable. By Friday night, I was a pro again. And Sony got to start off on a great note. You know, they they kind of I remember seeing Anthony at the beginning of the year and it was I was I saw him get Shelton and I was like, I don't know about this squad, though. I mean, yeah, I mean, the opponent, not a you know, they're not up to Anthony's level, even on Anthony a down year. So good, good start for the, the for the charges there. Uh, we got a McKnight there. You got a Dobbs in there. You got still, you got some guys there. Uh, we'll uh, anxious to see what happens to them. But getting back to my game, I was really nervous uh, at Rafferty Stadium. I could feel the electricity in the air, though, as we waited for these teams to come walking out. You know, the sun's going down. Uh, you, and they were kind of playing like a, it was like a standoff. Who was going to walk out first? Favorite prep wasn't walking out first. Their field. The better yeah. hand took its sweet time walking out. And finally, they did the Cascades of Booze. And they were met by Eric Becker, their new head coach. Um, and then we all turned around and looked toward the field with the big banner. Was ready, waiting for the Fairfield Prep students. They're uh, the players. They start walking out. All the parents are like reaching over the rails with their with their phones. And it, we were off, man. And uh, once they came flying out of there, the place erupted. Great crowd. I don't know about your game at Southington and Maloney, but a great crowd at my game. And we were off, Pete. Yeah, so Southington packs it out well. Um, M- Maloney didn't really travel that great. Uh, looked like a lot of parents and family members, but Southington student section was packed. Uh, no, the blue, the blue night crew or whatever they're the night crew with a K. They were popping. It was loud. Um, the band, the Southington band, the guy, another thing I forgot. Southington band is so good. They give them a twenty minute halftime because of the band instead of like the normal. 15 or 10 minutes, 12 minutes, whatever the halftime is. It's a full 20 at Southington. So the band can play. So it was cool atmosphere though. It was just, it was good to be back. It was good to, you know, see coaches watch football and, you know, it was a little rusty, but you know, it was yeah. just good to be back out there. No, it was certainly great to be back there. And I got, I, I was really anxious to see all the, the comments from the kids after the game and how great it was to be back. I mean, you know, you have Christian Russo from, from Cheshire saying he was crying. He was so emotional about playing again. And, um, you know, a lot of other kids across the state, uh, the, the feelings were mutual. He went on an overtime game, but and so, so that got them started off great. But, um, you know, back, back at Fairfield prep, it was, it, there were a lot of guys there. I had no idea. I, I guess I didn't read the preview. I had no idea who any of these guys were, but they came to play, man. Fairfield prep came to play and just basically other than a, a, a series, it turns out in the second quarter, where Hans scored immediately. Seth Schweizer having a great day, you know, debut, you know what I mean? Coming back uh, for his senior year, a great uh, series for him and uh, Patch Flanagan. They were down 3 nothing. a couple of Schweitzer, big Schweitzer plays. Next thing you know, Daniel Hans looking like the old Daniel Han of old, but Prep prep was bringing it. They got this kid, 6'3 quarterback, Connor Smith. He makes one of the best plays I've ever, I've ever seen a quarterback make, especially one of his side, 6'3". Does the old Barry Sanders like you, you, someone tries to attack you high and you're like hanging out, you're still on your feet, no knees, and you're like sitting on your on your on your, uh, on your on your on your heels, and then still gets up, slips through a guy, scores, and that just got it going. And next thing you know, they had a uh, hand, they, they defense stopped hand, and then Tymaine Smith, this kid looked impressive. Another senior takes a pass from, from Smith, goes into the end zone, and 16 all. Uh, for uh, Fairfield Prep, and then at the beginning of the uh, second half, Dan Barnick, Barnick, excuse me, 54-yard run. And at that point, you know, you knew that the it was not going to be hands down. I thought the defense played really great. They were hitting. Uh, they had a lot of uh, great players who were just you know swarming to the ball, and hand looked like a deer in headlights sometimes, especially in that second half. And uh, 
just a really impressive performance from Favorite Prep, which, you know, usually you, Favorite Prep looks impressive coming out of the, uh, off the bus, or out of the locker room, and then, they, then they, they don't do so great when they're on the field. This one kind of lived up to the hype, and I was really impressed by this, uh, by this Smith kid. I, I thought he was, uh, what was his name? Colton Smith, the old quarterback from seven years ago. I thought he was, it was his brother or something. No, it turns out he had moved in from San Diego. So uh, Fairfield Prep got some players here, and uh, I don't think we've heard the last of them, certainly. No, we're definitely not going to hear the last of them, but that Smith run, if you haven't seen, I, I, I screen grabbed it right at the top where there's like an inch between his butt and the turf, and he just goes down, pops up, and he's gone. It was one of the most impressive high school football plays I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Just a quick thing in hand there. Number number one, I don't. There, I know a lot of people had a lot of things to work on, so you know we're not killing hand too much here, but – Hand came out immediately when they scored their first touchdown. Hand came out uh, immediately in a, in a muddle huddle. And then when they scored again, Schweitzer scored their second touchdown, a 17-yard pass. They came out in, a, in another weird formation to go for two points. I don't think they have a kicker. Or I don't think they have a, a guy who can, you know, regularly kick something. Meanwhile, Fairfield Prep got, has this kid, Aiden Graham. Kid booming it into the end zone. I, I mean, they... They got everything. They got it. Looks like prep. Uh, you know, maybe they would. They played last year, and I didn't know about. It. Yeah, well, it's pretty amazing that a lot of schools don't have kickers, or a lot of teams don't have kickers. Maloney had three red zone trips where they had turnovers on downs, and they didn't kick. They didn't yeah. even like try to kick. Um, Southington did try to kick a field goal. Uh, Jack Barnum, their quarterback, missed thirty-five yarder. I couldn't tell where it missed because it looked good for me, but I had a really bad angle on the side, so I couldn't really tell, and it was really high. Um, I think that's just an overall thing across the state that a lot of these schools don't have kickers, yeah. which I find really bizarre, but that's a whole other thing. No, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see about that. But the other thing was, all right, so after the game, Eric Becker, just inconsolable. <laughs> I could say he, uh, he took it really hard. And uh, well, here's Eric Becker right now talking about the loss. You know, ultimately any failure of this team is a failure on me and it's my fault entirely. Um, and uh, I, I didn't do a, a good enough job, uh, and 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 that's that's, that's on me. I mean, <laughs> Eric, I know you're disappointed you didn't win your opener. I know this was a big moment for you, but man, man, it is week one. <laughs> it's like, well, you, the look the the expectations at hand are to win every game, and yeah, no one knows the expectations more than him. Player, assistant coach, now head coach. The year off. I think there were a lot of motions going around for a lot of teams across the state with that itch to win, right? Christian Russo said he cried uh, after the game that Cheshire went against no- Notre Dame. Was it because he scored the touchdown to win or was it because, holy crap, we're finally doing this yeah. again? I got a lot of that al- across the state, but um, but a- Eric, my man, you got a lot of football <laughs> games left in hand. Uh, you know, I'm sure the guy standing next to you, Steve Philpone, will tell you all about you know, you have high expectations and not, you know, maybe not coming through, but your first time hands got some stuff to work on special teams, obviously a big deal. The offensive line, you know, the, those guys have their work cut out for them this year. They're going to have to, you know, step it up because they kind of got manhandled a little bit, maybe a little, you know, shock. I mean, a lot of offensive lines across the state. We're going to talk to our economist, Jeff Jacobs, about some of the issues. A lot of these teams might have had coming off a, a year off, but, uh, you know, a lot of offensive uh, t- offensive lines had some issues out there. So, uh, you know, nothing. Nothing to ring the alarm on just yet. Just make sure you get back to work on it. Pete, you know, your game was uh, probably one of the other games of the, of the week. Um, you know, we had that. This was our game of the week. Fairfield prep beating him. But uh, you were up there at Southington. You know, you talked a little bit about the atmosphere. But what, what was the game? It, it didn't sound like other than the ending. It didn't sound like it was anything great. though. No, it really wasn't. Uh, it looked like both teams hadn't played in a year. Because yeah. that's <laughs> the fact of the matter. Um, you know. Ryan, Ryan Del Monte took the uh, short pass 42 yards with a minute and 14 seconds left to win the game. That was a great play. Broke a couple of tackles. But that was really it in that game. You know, there was no swinging momentum. There was no – there was a lot of three and outs, uh, four and outs with turnovers on downs. There wasn't a lot of football moving down the field. Both teams couldn't run the ball. Both offensive lines are still meshing together, it seems quarterbacks didn't have a lot of time running backs could barely get back to the line of scrimmage made the defenses look awesome, but I think there's still a lot to be worked out. And I don't think they're the only two teams in the state that, if, that are facing that issue, 
Um, I think a lot of these, I think both teams would have wished they would have played later in the year now when they're both, you know, fully firing on all cylinders, but it was, it was very blah. Yeah. Maloney, I thought we both thought they were, they deserve to be in the top 10. They're not I in still the top do think 10. They should be. Yeah. I mean, I, even though they lost, I mean, there are some comments. Why is hand still in the top? We'll get to that right now. Actually, why don't we go through this whole thing and kind of talk about it. number 10 is killingly, you know, Jack Sharp was, uh, was great. He scored the first three scores and they got he another guy sharp. too. Huh? Jack Sharp was sharp. Yeah. <laughs> so the the uh, the team formerly known as the Red Hawks off to a one and zero start against the Waterford team. Uh, that was a good start for Killingly. Uh, they're number ten. Number nine. Hand only drops from three to nine, so we give him a little bit of a mulligan. Okay, fair for prep and be better than you, but uh, a, a tough performance uh, for sure. Hand. Listen, Schweitzer's good, and you know O'Brien is good, and Patch Flanagan very good. They have some guys. Um, we're just see how they respond though. The schedule is not going to do them very many favors. Number eight is Xavier. We talked a lot about Drew Crone, but the guy that led Xavier back in this game against uh, NFA 31, 19 was DJ, Wright, The other guy, you know, they, they said Andy Gee at the beginning of the season said, we have our two seniors. We're going to ride him. Crone and the other guy, DJ, Wright showing up and Crone didn't have a great, great day. But Wright certainly uh, carrying Xavier there. They're one to know. Fairfield Prep jumps into number seven. It may be a little low considering. It's way too low. Yeah. It beat the number three team. Beat the number three team. I think Fairfield Prep got a little uh, undersold here. So Pete and I are on your side here, Jesuits. Uh, I think seven might be a little much. I was impressed. I didn't see New Canaan. I didn't see New Town. I didn't see some of the other ones. But I think you should be at least in the, in the six, five, maybe a four spot. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Uh, speaking of that, number six, Southington, which you saw. Did you drop him, Pete? I have to pull up my ballot quickly. Here it is. <laughs> um, I did drop Southington. Yeah. I dropped them to nine and Maloney to ten. Because right. I think they're both two top ten teams. And I think that, you know, they just happen to play each other. But I also had Fairfield Prep in my top 10 at the beginning of the year. Yeah, me too. So I jumped Prep up to six. So actually not that much higher. Now I'm looking back. I'm like, oh, maybe I should have put them a little bit higher. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, You know, but I also have Xavier at three. So, you know, my polls, are, I think, a lot different than a lot of other people. Pete, I had Fairfield Prep at number five in my top 10. You know, I, I ranked them pretty high there, you know, just above Southington. Um, I thought that they were that impressive uh, to start the year. I mean, listen, they, they it, it, we have a long way to go, and they got a tough schedule too. But uh, I, I I bumped them up to five. I think I might have had them at nine or ten to start the season, so I bumped them up pretty high. Uh, number six, you just talked about Southington. Number five, New Canaan played Bridgeport Central, forty nine to nothing. Can't really get a good read on New Canaan. I don't have them that high, to be honest with you. I've only only have them at number ten, but. You know, I, I still would like to see them first. They got some big games, obviously, coming up. Yeah, I got I got New Canaan at seven, and I, I agree. I think I might have them a little bit too high. Um, here's the thing about New Canaan. They're very good. Like, they're going to be good. They're New Canaan. But when was the last time New Canaan won a big game against someone other than Darianne? Yeah, I mean, it's been a while. It's been a yeah. few years, at least. You know, I'm, and they don't have they don't have some of the characters we're used to there. You know, it's a new team, and they, listen, there's plenty of talent in New Canaan. Absolutely. Right? But I just uh, need to see a big win. Yeah. Well, I need to see him first. Let's see. Yeah. I want to get a, get a look at these guys. No, no more Drew Pine for the first time in you know five or whatever, five years. Five so years. that'll be interesting. Number four is Newtown. Newtown is actually, I think I've mentioned this. Newtown is my number one team. You know, could you convince me to put Darian there? Yeah, probably. We'll find out very soon who the number one team is when those two show off and uh, show showdown, excuse me, in a week, uh, next week, right? Not this week coming up, the week after, right? Newtown, Darian. Yep. So we'll figure that one out real quick. That's why I was able to throw Newtown in there. Number one, they got four first place votes uh, this week. I think they had four last week as well. So they're one and zero. They it was a little sketchy against against Pomp Rock. It was 21 17 at halftime. And then they outscored the uh, the Panthers 20 to nothing in the second half. So Newtown off to a good start. Number three, Greenwich. No problems with West Hill. Again, hard to get a good read on them. They only have two first place votes, but they're sitting there. They take hand spot at number three. Number two is St. Joseph, which, look, you were at that game, Pete, looked dominant against a team. Everyone loved Danbury. Everyone loved Dan Danbury. You know, Augie, Thierry's done a really nice job there. But, you know, I mean, they they, they weren't five. Well, they were five and five last time out. Danbury's got to okay. show us something here. And uh, 
St. Joseph showed us just how far Dan uh, Danbury's got to go. But that was impressive. Morrissey's coming out there and just blowing their doors. Morrissey's, Hutchison's, Warren's. There's names, names that have done this before in the past for St. Joe's. Uh, they look great. I mean, they were, I was pleasantly surprised with how clean they look. Now, I don't know if that's saying that, you know, St. Joe's is great because I don't think we know that yet. Uh, but I do think it's a testament to the coaching staff at St. Joe's. Like, they looked really good. And or, uh, is Danbury better than we think, or are they worse than we think they are? You know, like, we don't, we're not really going to know how to view this St. Joe's performance until a couple of more weeks. But I will say, Danbury's got, you know, some guys, Nick Smith, Artest Taft, like, they got to get the ball in their hands. I mean, Taft made this unbelievable catch mm. up the sideline. Like, and they're gonna they're gonna put the ball in their hands, so we'll see. But I was so impressed with St. Joe's. I was like, oh, they got the ball at one point. I was running down the sideline with um with Gabby uh from MVC, and I was gonna go to the end zone, and she like stops at like the 15. I go, three plays, St. Joe's is in the end zone. Watch this. <laughs> Next play, Morrissey throws a touchdown pass. So I get it, and I'm walking back, and one St. Joe's fan looks over and he goes, I thought you said three plays. There are a lot of funny stories like that all weekend, man, but that's a good one. Um, and, of course, number one is Darianne, 11 first place votes. Uh, they beat Fairfield Ward 41 to 8. You know, it took them a little while to get the rust off a bit there, but Miles Drake passed for 158 yards and three touchdowns, and uh, Coach Mike Forge gets his first win. So that was a – that was a that's your top 10, Pete. You know, as we mentioned, I think we thought Fairfield perhaps a little low, but other than that, I think it's okay. Cheshire I have actually in my top 10. They're in there at number 12. Staples, we'll talk about that victory uh, over Trumbull with Jeff Jacobs in a little bit. But uh, Staples with a big win in Mars Petraccio's homecoming. Um, they're in there at number uh, number 13. I actually put them in my top 10, uh, my top 15 for my first find. I think I have Staples at number 13. Another one that really impressed me, we'll talk about Berlin. That's another one. They're at 14. And then Sheehan. At 15, if you want to run down the list, you can go check out a game time CT. Uh, but that's your top 10. Again, we're still figuring this out as we go. Pete. Yeah, I mean, this thing will never be perfect. And I don't think, you know, we will know, have a full understanding until maybe week six would be my guess of when we can look at the poll and say, this is not, you know, this is what the top teams in the league are. Cause I think right now there's a lot of moving parts. We're going to see a lot of crossover in the next couple of weeks. We're going to, you know, find out who's the number one team when Darian and Newtown play in two weeks. So, or who the voters would vote like the winner of that game. If they both win this week will be number one at the end of week three. So yeah. it, it's time will tell time will tell. Just looking over some of the other results. You know, I spent all Saturday kind of hitting um, a bunch of bunch of games. I saw Rocky Hill beat East Catholic. Um, there, nothing really stood out uh, from that game, except there's a referee Pete in the CCC uh, or Central Connecticut board, the Hartford board. He looks like Santa Claus or Uncle Jesse. I swear to God. <laughs> I swear to God. I don't know. He is a he, but he rocks the, the white beard, white. You know, he looks great. Uh, and it might be Santa Claus. I don't know. Or it could be Uncle Jesse. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But <laughs> that's the one thing I got out of that game. Um, and then uh, I ran up to see Hartford Public, and we'll talk to Harry Bellucci about what their their impressive performance. Great start, 43-7 to uh, 43-7 over Northwest Catholic. And then I saw Simsbury, and one of the best performances by a kid, a senior, Pete, Evan Wallace, who didn't play at all. This was his first varsity game starting for Simsbury, and the kid basically did it all. Two rushing touchdowns, a pick six, and a passing touchdown, and he was great for the uh, Trojans as they try to get back to the state playoffs. Uh, so those were some of the performance. And how about uh, this kid from New Fairfield? Speaking of uh, seniors who didn't play when they were when they were younger, Caswell ran for 316 yards and five touchdowns as the Rebels just absolutely buried the defending Class M champion West of Trojans. Pete, what do you think? That was I, but I, I'm pretty sure I said this. Like, we're going to see names. These kids are going to come out of nowhere. Even Alex Marshall at Bristol Eastern, right? What he rushed for 242 with four touchdowns. I mean, there are some dudes in this state, and they're just starting to rise to the top. And this might just be the beginning. They but are man, when you have a guy. Yeah, when you have a guy that rushes for uh, three sixteen, is, I mean, that's incredible. Yeah. You know, and shout out to Coach Fada. 
who is a friend of the program, but for completely leaving him off his top players on the on the uh, yeah. on the on the preview. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's Feta, but it, Feta. Yeah, I, such a such a good friend of the program. We can't even get his last name right. <laughs> Another guy I thought was great was Cam Edwards and Narc. He was ridiculous. Stud. Uh, ridiculous. He's a stud. Um, you know, those are just some of the names. We're gonna get to know all these guys throughout the uh, throughout the year, but there were some really good performances uh, this week. So uh, and last but not least, a huge congratulations to Jen Stango Garzon for winning, becoming the first female in Connecticut State history. Uh, to uh, to to win a game as a head coach, she had a she was a brief run as, as the uh, the what was it the uh, MCW the, yeah MCW one I got wrong last week MCW United uh, they she was at one year her head coach she was a head coach in 2019 they didn't win a game now they've got Nanawag into the fold here no more who's time they got Nanawag into the fold here and Nanawag's got you know they, they've been trying to become a program for the last ten years and they got some kids there they got at least seventeen kids. Uh, contributing to the program now and she's got some players and you know now because she can actually coach and not have to worry about you know score management all that kind of stuff so congratulations to Jen you know now my favorite quote of the whole week was I just like coaching football you know I just love coaching and that was a great great one by uh, Jen so congratulations to her joining us on the show now is our game time CT sports columnist first week of football on the job Jeff Jacobs he was out at Staples High school to see that barn burner first game out of the box, Jeff. You got a classic. What'd you think? I think I had the best game of the week for sure. Uh, Adam Barron's the uh, Staples coach who had been down at IMG uh, for a decade and had been involved in some one versus two games with 10,000 people in the stands. He called it the coolest game he'd ever been part of, not even close. Really? So I think that's wow. worth it or something. It was, uh, you know, it kind of uh, typified maybe uh, week one and all in one game. There were, there were mistakes, unbelievable plays, ending with a uh, uh, pick six by Charlie Howard, 73 yards with 17 seconds to go to win it. Uh, great play from Ryan Thompson. Uh, uh, too many penalties on both team, uh, teams to count. Uh, guys cramping. It, we, had, we had a little uh, – from everything I read afterwards uh, – I got a I got a piece of everything. The place was was jammed too. It was a big crowd. Uh, Mars Petraccio, I'll say his name. Coach P. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, they have they have they have a great video tribute to him. A lot of emotion. Little little piece of everything there. Game one. It's always a fun place to uh, to go to a game. But you know, talk about the mistakes. I mean, heard from a lot of coaches, a lot of reporters at games this week that. It, it looked like there was a lot of rust. Um, I, uh, you know, the Maloney Southington game, the offensive lines really didn't look like they were clicking. Uh, I don't know if it was because Southington and Maloney have great defenses. I don't think they have bad defenses, but I don't think they have that great of defenses. Uh, quarterbacks didn't have a lot of time. Uh, you know, you just saw it on Twitter. Even our, our friend up at the Hartford Current, Sean McFarland, kept tweeting out from the Bloomfield game. He's like, looks like there's a lot of rust. And, uh, it definitely showed week one in most matchups, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, I had a few, few, I think I said it on Saturday when I was walking around and we, we, we showed it a little bit before uh, that, that there are a lot of, you know, touchdowns called back, which is, you know, I think it's kind of par for the course on week one, but there was a lot more better. There are a lot more other anecdotes like, you know, uh, coaches saying that they had to explain basic football to their kids, you know, like uh, uh, Dave Masters up at Simsbury saying he had to explain to one of his kids what uh, intentional grounding was or, you know, or Tom Brockett saying that just little things that we you don't we don't we take for granted that we don't ever work on because they're varsity football players. They should know this stuff. Remember, these aren't really varsity football players until as of last week. And now he's trying to they have to explain little things. So like, you can't do this on a play. You got to do that on a play. And I found that fascinating. And so, you know, we knew there was going to be a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a learning curve here this season. I'm wondering how long it's going to take. Though. This is the one thing that I want to talk about. I love guys jumping up out of nowhere, because this is the ultimate jumping out of nowhere uh, year in football. I don't know which one of you guys put uh, Ryan Thompson among the top 25 uh, players among the six quarterbacks on that list without him ever playing a varsity game. But let me tell you one thing. This kid was terrific. He's a three-sport guy, terrific luck, lacrosse player, point guard on their basketball team. He's nimble. He's got good arm strength, and he really can throw on the run. And whenever Trumbull put on pressure, he, his escape ability, as they call it, 
was outstanding. He was 20 of 33. He had nearly 300 yards, a couple touchdowns, one called back, as so many of them were this week. But he's a good one. Yeah, yeah. he uh, – I believe he played wide receiver uh, before this year. And I believe that follows – and Sean, you can correct me wrong. I believe that follows in the footsteps of Jake Thaw. Uh, yeah, the Mich- similar. Yeah, he was I, a wide it, out, moved yeah. to quarterback. Now he's in Michigan, so yeah, good for Jake. Yeah, but cool. it's that it's that kind of same blueprint with him and – you know, the way, you know, Adam Barron's was down at IMG, he worked with quarterbacks. I mean, Adam, like, exclusively just worked with quarterbacks, and he's worked with some pretty great ones. Uh, so, I mean, if we had to take an educated guess, I would assume Staples would have had a good coach, but I'm going to take that credit, uh, Jake, for, for getting him on the top 25. I don't know if it was me or not, but I'm taking that credit. <laughs> you are, I, I'm telling you, he's top 12.5. <laughs> I really believe that. Uh, uh, yeah, I was talking to him today. Uh, for a story coming up and uh, he gives coach Barron's credit, a lot of credit uh, in, in um, able to teach a lot of things very quickly. Cause like I say, he's a three, he didn't, this guy's not a uh, product of any uh, uh, quarterback elite training club. You know, he plays three sports and he worked on his arm strength during, during the summer, but, but Barron's taught him a lot. And Barron said, this guy is as quick a study bright kid as he's had. And yeah, he saw, he played quarterback, as a kid, and like I said, he played wide receiver to get on the field as as, as a sophomore. And uh, and here he is the other one. I all right. I love the fact that everybody turns on us when we pick them wrong. Okay, uh, it, I revel in that, Welcome especially. Club. Well, I know. Uh, maybe I'll get sick of it, but anyway, like Berlin after after I picked Middletown and listen to Sal, great and big and which call they got from thirty three to nothing. And of course, Berlin was uh, in, and we'll never learn. And I said, hey, it's only my first week. And I wrote a note to myself, be careful on Berlin. And then, uh, and then New Fairfield, I flipped the coin here uh, 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 when they played Weston because the New Fairfield coach had not yet turned in his preview. Mm. And then I understand when he did, he didn't, le- didn't include Jason Caswell in. Yeah. And then- and then Jason Caswell is like talking afterwards, like people slept on. Yeah. on <laughs> I was in a football coma, J- Jason. Okay. A football coma. I never heard of you before last week. He runs 306 yards, five touchdowns over West Weston. Now I heard of him. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like that was a common thing. And this is not like, you know, the oversleeping or anything, you know, Fairfield prep had some words for Sean. Oh, yeah. Uh, when they didn't have guys on the top 25, they didn't get any love in the poll. Southington had a few comments for me uh, about, you know, uh, about us picking Maloney or talking about voting Maloney ahead of, of Southington. That's the thing, though. And that's the beauty of this season, I think, is that we're going to see a lot of new faces. There are kids who, I mean, you know, Caswell's probably going to have go on and have a great year. But, you know, I think there are going to be guys who are going to be popping up week seven who might make our all state team because they're going to just it's going to click for them late in the year. And they're going to go on and like lead their team to a state title. It's going to be crazy. First week, beauty and the beast, but more beauty. Cause we got to get out there and, was, and I got to go to a terrific game. Even if you didn't like your game, Pete, I, I look, I, I like to get, look, anytime you get a touchdown in the final two, two minutes for the winner, it's a good game. But I think both Kevin Frederick and, and Mike Drury, who, who was not coaching at the game, he was under the weather will say when they looked at that film that there were a lot of missed opportunities. They did not play a clean game. And that wasn't Maloney or Southington football. Because for three and a half quarters, it was a very blah kind of game. Uh, and then it really picked up. And, uh, you know, uh, Barnum, the quarterback for Southington, dialed in back to back, you know, drives where they got down and they snapped the ball over his head and turned it over. Then they got back down again, lined up for a field goal. He's one of the best, you know, special teams guys in the state misses what I think was a 35 yarder gets the ball the third time in a row. Wasn't going to be beat, went right down the field and won the game. So exciting ending, but the first three and a half quarters were uh, left, left a lot to be desired. That's the difference between you and me, Pete. You, you go to a game and you see lousy offensive line play. I go to a game and see Ryan Del Monte catch a 42-yard touchdown pass with a minute to go. Well, I was there Thank from like 5 you. o'clock on, so it took until about 8.45 for well, something to happen. One thing we got to agree on, the days of like – Getting in and out in an hour and a half, the guy ru- pound the ball, running uh, like in a thirty-five to seven game. Those days are over. Oh, yeah. the, some of these games are taking three hours plus. Like the other one I went the other night, they they, uh, they last forever. 
Yeah. But a lot but of fortunately, I do have an announcement here that I got a uh, cortisone shot to my herniated disc the week before the start of the season. I took in all three and a half hours of that game, uh, three hours and 15 minutes of that game in, in Staples the other night and didn't feel any pain at all. So I'm ready. Yeah. That's a good. win. Well, this this is usually the week where we, you know, you have the top 10 poll and you kind of throw it out there and see what happens and see who kind of takes who's not ranked to heart and who, you know, who doesn't belong there or not. And then you kind of, so there's a reason why you kind of, the Ned Griffin at the day puts out his coaches poll next this week, actually, instead right. of doing a preseason poll. Personally, I like the preseason poll because I like how it kind of fires everybody up, especially the players. This is an advocate for, I mean, we may get it wrong as long as we correct it. I'm fine with it, but you know, I, this is why I love to do the preseason poll because these kids get fired up about who got disrespected and who did it. You know, you get all that Fairfield prep, one of those teams and, uh, yeah, and it paid off for them. You know, who needs her, you know, who deserves respect me. I'm hopping on a bus with, with Quinnebog Valley Saturday morning, going all the way out to Danbury for a little ATI game and, uh, coming back with them. So I think we're going to have yeah. a, how about that? That that's what you talk real. So anybody wants to call me a prima donna co- columnist, only going to FCAC games? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm out there with the tech boys. What else, uh, Jeff? Did you notice from this week? Uh, you know, heading into this next one, anything else you learned? Uh, yeah, hand. I thought they. I thought they'd do better. I. Uh, th- that was uh, interesting. Uh, uh, Trumbull's vaunted. Oh, not wanted, but like much ballyhooed, huge offensive line didn't do that. That goes in with Pete. So I don't know. I think they can do better. That was uh, that was uh, something that I saw. Um, yeah, like I said, New Fairfield, New Fairfield West, and just because we had a like I remember I was I told you I was begging for for help on that pick, and every, you know, the best I came up with was that uh, that it was a it was a pick'em game. Well, it wasn't a pick'em game. It just showed you how how I mean. There, there's some wild disparities, you know. When I yeah. picked Middletown, I was serious. I mean, I don't, didn't. Oh yeah, know well, Sal talked him up. Yeah, thirty-three nothing for crying out loud. That's that's you know. So <laughs> we forgot Berlin's Berlin. Berlin's been around. Middletown's yeah, still trying to Yeah, they've been around. Back. You're right. But uh, I still think um, I got a lot more respect for St. Joe's after the first game. They not, look not that, I, not that I disrespected them, but like they look good. They yeah. looked, uh, you know, Matt Morrissey. I believe it's – there's so many Morrisseys. At one point, they're I twins. thought there were one – they're not twins. One's a senior, oh, one's really? a junior. They are not twins, so this is my story. One, I thought they were the same person. <laughs> then I was told by someone on the line that they were twins. And then when I looked at the roster, one's a senior, one's a junior. So – and then there's Mike, who was our player of the year two years ago. Uh, but St. Joe's looked good. They looked like – Again, not that we didn't think that they would have competed for a championship. I just think that we wanted to kind of see it a lot. <clears throat> a lot of new faces, a lot of new players, a lot of the same last names. You know, Matt Morrissey, I mentioned him before. He's the new starting quarterback. There's another Hutchinson who's yeah. wearing number one, just like I'm assuming his brother Brady. Um, there's another Warren. I mean, there are mo- there are so well. many. He played great. So many of those names. Um, and I think we like Danbury. I think we like the Danbury program. I think we like what coach Thierry is doing and has done there. So as lopsided as it was kind of surprised me, St. Joe's winning didn't surprise me how lopsided it was. Did surprise me. Pete quick. According to Joe Del Vecchia, that they are twins. Really? It is in my preview. They are twins. I didn't get that. I didn't pull that out of a, then I got a message from someone saying, telling me that they weren't twins. Uh, so uh, I am, I am. I got them both listed as some seniors. Mike, Mike, I know you listen, Mike, you, you, uh, you love us. You were retweeting all the stuff. Please reach out to me. Tell me if your brothers are twins or not, because I am so confused right now with the Morrissey's. I Speaking of St. Joe and the FCI quick, before you go on, we move on. St. Joe 35, Danbury zero, Greenwich 35, West Hill zero. Darian 34, Ward 0, New Canaan 42, Bridgeport Central 0. Those were your Saturday uh, halftime scores for the uh, Blue Bloods in the FCAC against the, uh, you know, the, the teams that are looking up. Uh, it looks like the haves and have nots are, are still uh, it's a very, it's not a very fine line there in the FCAC. I didn't see any of them. I was sleeping. And if anybody wonders how it goes in the, 
in the wonderful world of covering high school sports, the Westport uh, Staples game, Trumbull's game lasted forever. I pulled into my office at, uh, at the rest stop near Fairfield on I-95, got my Wi-Fi going for McDonald's there in the rest stop and wrote different like 11.15 to 1.30. And then I drove the rest of the home all the way to Eastern Connecticut. So yeah. it was, uh, I'll tell you what, they closed. Um, this is the biggest scoop of the, of the week here. They closed Dunkin' Donuts at that rest stop at like by 11 o'clock. You wouldn't have believed how many people came in and said, hello, hello. They all wanted, they all wanted coffee or an apple and spice. It already closed apple up. And spice. Well, you're going to have to bring your own coffee uh, this weekend. Cause I, I don't think eight, I don't think Quinnebog Valley is going to have uh, Duncan on the bus. Yeah. They will well, we look forward to hearing all about that trip, Jeff. I mean, as, as only you can tell it, it should be a fascinating one. You know, you, you're taking one for the team. I think Pete was supposed to make that trip a few years ago and it never really panned out for us. Um, I know he's been up there by himself, but it's one thing to drive yourself. And it's one thing to actually take the bus and go back and forth with the kids. So, uh, Thank you for taking one for the team on that. We look, we look forward to reading all about it instead of. I want I want live tweets, Jeff. I want like selfies uh, yeah. with the players. That's what I want. <laughs> it is, and there's some of my boys there from uh, from Plainfield go to Ellis Tech. You know, we, we got a wide wide thing there. Uh, Thompson, Putnam, some kids from Killingly. Although if they were really good at football, Chad Neal would have commandeered them. Uh, some Plainfield kids. Uh, hey, I'm going to make some new bros in that trip. I'm All right, we got we got quick breaking news before Sean wraps up. I just spoke with Mike Morrissey. His brothers are twins, so I don't know who this person is who messaged me and said they weren't. Yeah. I'm sorry for the false information. You got to do your homework, Pete. You got to do your homework. Oh, All right. Well, so that's great. With all that said, we appreciate you coming on, talk a little bit about your experience, Jeff. Can't wait for the uh, bus ride. Thanks for joining us this week. We'll, we'll talk to you next time. All right. Well, Pete, that was uh, Jeff Jacobs. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you know, effervescent as always is the uh, – will be joining us for the, for the rest of this season, giving us his take on what he's seen uh, in the high school football world. And uh, so let's move on to our next guest, the great Harry Bellucci of Hartford Public. Talk about his team's big 43-7 victory over Northwest Catholic. Joining us on the show is, of course, the head football coach at Hartford Public. It's Harry Bellucci. He's been all over the place. 38 years it's teaching, 42 years coaching. He was an assistant at Buckley for 23 years. and. Uh, He's been at Hartford Public since 2003, and he had a great opening win. I believe it was their first it's 14 coach, uh, or at least, or at least it's been a few years since you had a great opening win, 43 to seven over Northwest Catholic on the beautiful new field behind Hartford Public High School. My first time there, so I don't even know what the old field is like. But welcome, Coach. Thanks for joining us on the show. We appreciate it. Happy to be here, man. Definitely happy to be here. Yeah. Well, tell us a bit about that first game. I mean. Uh, you know, I, it's been two years since we played football or feels, you know, yeah, it's been two years. You know, we missed last year. You know, you don't know what you have every in any given year. And just to get out there with a brand new field, it, it, tell us about what the experience was like for your guys. I think, you know, you always get those butterflies before the first game or any game, actually. But, you know, having played in two years, I definitely had the butterflies. But I really felt more a sense of pressure to win the first game ever played on that field. I said, I don't want to not win the first game we have to play on this field. And you know, you have an unknown quantity here because you haven't played in two years. But I think a big advantage that we had two years ago in 2019, the last time we played, our 2019 or 18. I, I know, it feels like it's like yeah. forever. Well, I mean, we were down to like 20 kids. And just because I had to, I played a bunch of sophomores, like six or seven of them. And it didn't go well. I mean, we were one in nine, but now it's paying dividends because all those guys played, uh, you know, counting scrimmages, 13 varsity games. So this year I have a bunch of kids and my seniors actually have varsity experience and a couple freshmen that had to play. My big right tackle there, Chris Pineda, he played, shouldn't have probably been playing, but he was 6'3", 300. So I wasn't worried. About <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and he was 13 years old at the time but he got that year of varsity experience. So having eight or nine kids that had a full year of varsity two years ago was definitely, a, a, a feels like a pretty big advantage to me. Was there anything that, uh, you know, well, tell us a little bit, actually, so was there anything that surprised you about how well you guys played? I mean, again, it was, you know, I only got there it was 18, nothing. 
But, uh, you know, Northwest Catholic starts to come back and kids started making some plays. But was there anything that kind of like surprised you or did you, or you, did you think you were going to be fast? You guys could make plays. I, I knew we, we have a lot of skilled uh, 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 skill players, a lot of talented skilled players. But I think a big difference this year in the team is, um, as you all know, Ron Leno, uh, baseball coach over at yeah. West Haven. Who is, who is now my next door neighbor engaged to one of my best friends said, I wanted to come up to, uh, he wanted to come to Hartford and do my last year and, and coach with me. So he took a leave of absent from West Haven and uh, high school for football for a year and him coaching the offensive line has made a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, that was the biggest surprise to me that this offensive line was making some nights, nice, but some nice big holes for my kids to get through. And, and once they got into the secondary, they were on the giddy up. Yeah, once you got the secondary, it was really fun because you guys kept blocking in the back and nullifying touchdowns. And you're like, uh, like no, we had a big discussion about that. You know, I said, if our guys are out front, don't touch anybody, please. They're not catching us. Don't block Latrell. anybody. Please. They're not going to catch us. Latrell. 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 Coach, you're not alone. Your kids are not alone in that. Everyone I saw a lot of blocks in the back, a lot of touchdowns nullified. I think that'll be worked out. I mean, that happens in week one. But but getting back to Ronnie, man, I, I hope uh, – you know, they might miss him. At, they might miss him at West Haven, but they might not miss him too much. I mean, uh, they might be deciding, you know, hey, Johnny, you're fine. Stay up in Hartford. We're good without you, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's great. To I, it was funny because he called me. and I'm up in Simsbury. I left your game. I went to Simsbury, and Ronnie's calling me. I'm like, what the heck does he want? And I let it ring, and I let it ring. I go to voicemail because I'm doing the interviews. And I call him back. I'm like, what do you want, Ronnie? And he's like, hey, I was at East Hartford. And sure enough, I go back. At, I mean, sorry, I was, in, I was at Harvard Public. I was coaching. What, what are you doing? You walk right by me. And I looked at the film and there he is. It's right next to you. And I'm like, oh, how did I miss him? I guess he's uh, he lost a little weight, huh, coach? Oh, God, yeah. He, he, he definitely lost a lot of weight. He's doing a good job working out and staying in shape now. Good for him. He's a great guy. And, you know, I just met him a couple of years ago. And uh, we are definitely fast friends. I mean, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie's yeah. all time. Yeah, we literally live next door to each other now. That's great. That's right an amazing Harvard, neighbor to have. Right That's really, he's an amazing neighbor to have. I mean, he's. I love covering West Haven baseball games because of Ronnie. Yeah. He's just so much fun. He's so animated and he's so into it. And everything that comes out of his mouth is for the kids. Like he's always backing up his kids. He always yeah. has their best interest at heart. And he's just one of my favorite people to ever cover. So Sean sent me the photo and he's like, Oh, do you see who's here? And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's coach Bellucci. He's like, no, no, no. Do you see who's right in front of him? And I had to do like a double take. I'm like, oh, he's not wearing blue and there's no uh, WH on his hat. So uh, I can't <laughs> I figure out if it was Ronnie or not. But lo and behold. Coach, tell us a little bit about, you know, how about speaking of guys, I guess, who, who are who've kind of shown up here. How about Christian Garcia? I mean, what a what a game this kid had. Uh, I guess he was from Bloomfield. Originally, he was on that team in 19. He, he's I don't know when he came over. But he had an impact. He had, you know, fumble recovery, two of them. One, he took 99 yards to the house. Well, the other, look, he was, look, look at your tape, buddy. It's 101 yards. Come on. Well, in, in, in <laughs> high school, you can't count. It's high school rules, coach. Come on. You've been around long enough. <laughs> high school, it is 101 yards. But in <laughs> high school, if the late Bob Barton is is shining down on me, say it's 99 yards. You got to say 99. It's not 101. But. Well, and the school record is going to be 101. <laughs> That's fine with me. That's fine but, with me. You know, I think Chris, Christian was at Windsor his freshman year, and then he was at Bloomfield his sophomore year. His junior year, he transferred here, and obviously we didn't play a season. Um, he has, whoever was coaching him before, and he had some private coaching, he has great football instincts and great, and he's very competitive. Um, he's a lockdown corner. I mean, his his skill set is, is, is very, very high, and his football knowledge is very high. And uh, on the first... Um, touchdown his on the pickoff mm -hmm. yells over to me he says coach what's the coverage I said we're in we're in cover two and then he's looking at me I said they're going to throw this hitch right now they're going to throw it and sure enough they, he threw the hitch and he just jumped it and gone 40 whatever yards so yeah I missed that but that, that was great that was early in the game but his his football instincts his speed and his quickness is definitely a, a game changer and you know we're, we're happy to have him yeah, he was in the right spot for that uh, fumble recovery. And that was a good, he knew it right there. You could watch him. You watch him in slow motion, strip the ball right at the goal line. Your first kid held him up. He came in, stripped it, and it was he was gone. And then later on, after I left, 
Uh, I got I saw the film where he fell on a fumble from a from one of your on your offensive plays. And then he had yeah. a, I mean, just uh, just like you say, in a, in a year where everybody's just brand new. I mean, to have a kid with great football IQ must be just going to help you immensely. Yeah, yeah, I'm, we're glad he's here. That's for uh, sure. How <laughs> about, you know, I guess how about EJ Williams, too? I mean, he had another kid who broke a, a few runs. He ran for 188 yards on just 10 carries and, and two touchdowns. Well, yeah, yeah, I said to him the other day, I says, Eric, since when did your name was EJ? I didn't know that. I just call you Eric. And he goes, oh, I'm Eric Jr. Now, you know, he ran track last spring and he as a freshman and I had him in my phys ed class and he ran an 11.06 hundred meters, you know, for a ninth grader, pretty darn fast. Um, when he when we finally started practice, because I had never seen him play uh, running up that hole and seeing his instincts. I was like, oh, this kid's got something special. Now, he came from England. He was a soccer player in England a long wow. time ago. And uh, but, you know, watching him in the weight room uh, all in the offseason, he was really probably one of our str- our strongest sophomores. And he was pretty serious about it. And he has he's an awesome personality. And you see, once he gets through the hole, his his ability to explode and, and take off is unbelievable. I mean, for a sophomore, this kid's going to be a big time, you know, some, there's always a reason to uh, stay, right? And you're looking at this kid and say, well, you know, maybe I ought to stay a couple of years. But, you know, yeah, yeah I, I can always find a reason to stay. But I think it will probably get into that time. Yeah, I was going to say, you're talking about all these great sophomores you have. Yeah. And I'm like, does he really want to retire now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like I have this Chris Pineda, who's a junior. Um, he He's probably like almost like an Ivy League player. He's number one in the class. He's from Venezuela. He's 6'3", 305. And he's got one year left. Said, so, well, maybe I should stay for Chris, you know, because I've been with him for three years. And then Chris graduates. Said, oh, I love this sophomore group. I went and wait to their seniors. And then another freshman group comes in. Yeah. Oh, you guys are special. Like, eh. All mean, right. So we'll leave it at 5%. Maybe you don't retire. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, I wouldn't even put it there, man. Maybe about 2%. <laughs> Ooh, I'll take that 2% well, <laughs> chance. But I mean, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, you announced before the year that uh, that you're retiring and Sean said it at the top. You know, 42 years uh, coaching, 38 years as a teacher. Uh, what what went into that decision, you know, for you to say, OK, this this is it. I mean, you know, did, did last year not having a season play an impact in the decision as well? The, well, last year impacted that I came back this year because I was going to do it. My thought process was I was going to do it, have last year be my last year. But I said, well, I'll be darned if I'm going to end my career on a non-football year after doing this for more than three quarters of my life. Um, I think I think the big issue, guys, is, you know, I get here at 6.30 in the morning. I try to get organized for football. And I teach all day. And then we do mandatory study hall. We're out in the field at 4. We're done at 6.30. We have a coaches meeting. By the time I pull into my driveway, it's 7.30. So I'm here, you know, 12 and a half hours a day, five days a week. And I think that it, and it's not the kids. My classes, the kids are wonderful here. They're the best part. But just being here. 13 hours a day is just something I don't want to do anymore. Yeah. I want, I want to try to do some other things in my life. And, you know, I, I, I feel like my ministry has um, gone on long enough and, and it's time for someone else to come in here and, and, and do it. And hopefully, you know, my thing is that I have a great sophomore class, uh, some really bright players. Uh, we've been able to uh, get a lot of great equipment. We have this brand new field. And whoever takes over this program is going to be in a good situation. And to me, that was very important that I leave this program healthy. You know, sometimes coaches leave and it's a hot mess and that I would never want to do that. So I'm feeling this is a good time to go because this program is on solid footing and, and I'm happy to leave it to somebody who can, uh, uh, you know, maybe do better than me. Now, yeah, 42, Harry, you oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Just, you know, 42 years, that's a long time. You've definitely seen a lot of changes throughout the game of football. Um, you know, and you've definitely had some great moments, which I, I want to talk about, you know, as we move forward. But, you know, what what has been the biggest change that, that you saw from coaching over the past 40 years? Like, you know, 40 years ago, teams were running the ball 80 you know, percent of the time. Now we're running five wide and throwing the ball all over the place. You know, what's one thing that you thought would never change? And now you're looking back you're like, wow, I can't believe we do that. Yeah, I mean, I came in on the era of the wing tee. Uh, wishbone football and then the big change was oh everybody's going to the eye you know what I mean that, that was like the radical change we're going I now that was my and, era um, yeah yeah and then you know with Frank St- the onset of Frank Stamilio at Suddington and him running that spread and then everybody going down to see Frank and learn how to run it and 
you know, it became a lot more, uh, I would say, less physical <laughs> than it used to be now with the spread offense and and then all the changes and then, you know, the sort of war we had to fight with parents not wanting to have their kids play because of concussions. And, and that's when I was on the committee with the CHSCA. Um, and I think just in the, the commercial, you know, what I think a big thing is for me is it seemed to me that the, the affluent communities seem to have a bigger advantage. You know, they have the more money, they have better training, they have better facilities, you know, and, and I feel like that's been a huge advantage uh, over the last 10 years, especially, I mean, between New Canaan, Greenwich and Darien, you know, how many state championships have they won, you know, over the last 10 right. years. And, you know, I always say this and a good friend of mine, you guys obviously know him, John Ferrazzi um, at Sheehan High School. The fact that he won a state championship is amazing in a two high school town because one high school towns dominate state championship games. And we talked about this before. Um, and, and I think, you know, well, I, I won't even bring this up because I know there's some sore points about having more divisions. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. You're, this is your time to talk. If, if it gives more schools and, you know, I think, I, I think the biggest change actually to thinking about this is going to be, and you're going to see way more of this now because I think there's 25 co-ops in the state now. Yeah. And that's going to continue to happen as rosters dwindle. I think we're in the 10th, ninth or 10th year of dwindling numbers for football. I mean, there were a few programs, legendary programs. Derby was thinking, considering going to just a JV program because I only have 19 or 20 kids. Right. And I know some will be and some of those places are down into the high teens or low 20s. So I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, that co-op football has become more and more affluent in Connecticut football. Would, would you what? think in terms of co-ops, like you speak about will be, and, you know, Hartford has a lot of uh, schools up there as well. What about, and this is just an idea, like a Waterbury team, like all the Waterbury public high schools have one team, you know, the Hartford public schools could have one team. Do you think that might like even footing or is that something that would just be really hard to get off the ground? Um, I don't think it would be harder to get off the ground. And I think it would be a wise thing to do. Or uh, maybe in Hartford too. I know Weaver High School now, you know, the legendary Jude Kelly Jude is Kelly, there now. Yeah. And he's got a couple great uh, brothers that helping him, Mark Anderson and uh, um, his brother Scott that were both at Plainville a couple years ago. And they're up to almost 30 kids now and they're, and they're running a junior varsity program. And, you know, for me to see Weaver football come back uh, would be a, 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 a tremendous thing. The, that's the one thing I always think about because now Buckley is, you know, SMSA. And once the new Buckley high school opens in 24, I want that program to be back up and running. There should, there needs to be Buckley football, Weaver football or Hartford high, but a good point that you make, you know, we might have to start considering making one team. I mean, in Waterbury too, you know, if there's only 15 to 20, 20 kids on each of those three Waterbury high school teams, why aren't you just doing one team? Exactly. Right. right. You're yeah. having a lot of competition too, coach. I mean, the, the, you back when you started, you know, when, when, when you were at Buckley, you know, uh, going to the state final, um, you know, there weren't a lot of these magnet schools and these other opportunities for kids. It seems like a lot of people wanted to kind of take slices of the pile. I don't know. You know, the magnet schools have been a big impact. A lot of like outside, maybe prep schools offering kids to take them out of the city. Look, look what we can give you up here, you know, in wherever prep. Um, you know, there are lots of challenges and obviously, you know, money is obviously an issue in the city schools. Um, you know, it, it means all those factors there. What do you think of all that? And, and, and you know, what, you know, what's your just take on it? Well, in Hartford, it literally killed sports at the high school level of, of the three big high schools. And the original plan was for all those magnet schools, kids would attend there. And at the end of the day, they would go back to their neighborhood high school, those three, and they would play sports there. But then it was like they were trying to compete all these magnet schools for the best students. So, oh, we offer this. We offer that. There are 11 boys basketball teams in Hartford. <laughs> 11. I mean, you just turned it into inter intramural basketball. That's exactly what you did. And, you know, Hartford, Buckley, Weaver, they were always in a state championship game. Yeah. Yeah. That's really hard to happen when there's 11 teams here. But you know, Weaver you wasn't that long ago. It was like 20 years ago. Not even. Oh, wait, not a, even. a little more than 20. But yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's. Th that's a sad state of affairs. And, you know, and, uh, unless we figure out how to get more kids playing uh, um, as far as, you know, contracting all of this stuff, I think um, Hartford schools are going to struggle athletic wise, as far as 
uh, uh, wins and losses and tournaments and stuff like that. Because, you know, there's not enough peanut butter to spread on that piece of bread. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. Um, as far as like, you know, you were on the committee for a while, you know, you're chairing the committee for a while until last year, um, you know, t- speaking about, you know, what changes we'd like to what would you what does Connecticut need? Do we need to go? Do we need to stick with classes? Do we need to revamp the state playoff system? Do we need to go kind of like, you know, divide this? Because it looks like leagues are all over the place. Your league just realigned. The SEC is all over the place. They're, we have the alliance now. It seems like we're everyone's got an idea of what to do with the state. Um, what is your opinion? I mean, you, Glenn, you've been in those meetings. What is your opinion? What do you think we should be doing in this state? I, I think a, f- a few things, and we've talked about this, you know, that sometimes you get a team from the uh, uh, tech league, you know, they'll qualify for the playoffs and, and the tech league football is not as, you know, advanced as, a, especially as, you know, and then you end up with a tech league team playing hand high school. I mean, that's just, you know, or even a co-op team playing at hand or playing at New Canaan. Right. Like Quinnabog's an L coach. Yeah, well, yeah, because they're in L because they have so many schools feeding in. But, you know, they may have four schools, but two schools, there's only 10 kids in total from those two schools, yeah. right? You know, the bigger, the 13 or I think, A, probably the co-ops need their own league now because you have 25 co-ops. You know, it's about the size of a division, that, which is about this. Yeah, pretty much. Right. 23. I think it's usually. Yeah. A division. I think it is 100. And how well, many? with it now, it's 30. Some, it's like 32. But if you divided it into six divisions, that's be 22 about each. It would yeah. be a little more than that. Yeah. Yeah. Ahead, I, I, I think something like that. Um, um, I, I mean, I think I like the way it's set up. I mean, as far as the number of boys in the school and, you know, uh, but the number of boys doesn't necessarily mean success. What's the biggest school? Danbury, Trumbo. When's the last time they won a state championship? I don't right. even know. Um, uh, I, I, I think six divisions would be better. Um the more, you know, I mean, it's a big thrill for a town and a community to get into the state playoffs. I mean, it really brings the community together. And after losing a year of football, we realized how important it was. I mean, you guys must have been just so bored last fall. <laughs> <laughs> with, 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 Lots with of pumpkin picking. Run around coach. all over the state. Oh, my God. And, and I just think that we have to do a better job. Uh, uh, promoting. I mean, you guys do a great job. Thank God for you guys. Because, you know, I mean, even though I, I love Sean McFarland is a great reporter and he loves high school football, but you know, we have this huge win. The first one on our football field and we got a little box score in the current, like just the box score, not a hey, Hartford public wins. There's nothing in there. And I'm like, you know, they, uh, so we the, as coaches have to do something to really promote our game and, and which what we tried to do with limiting the number of contact, the number of minutes of contact. So more parents would say, okay, we see that the coaches are trying to make this a safer game. And so more kids will play. That's the biggest thing I think. Getting- what do you, what do we do about the, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you brought it up a little bit. What do we do about the disparity in, uh, you know, demographics and income? I mean, that's obviously a big deal. I mean, we, we talk, I think Pete brought up a decent solution. Maybe you combine the harvest, but even then you're still, if someone wants something in UK and they just write a check, you know, if they need, but you guys need to fundraise for like three years, maybe even more, you know, uh, you just got a new field now. And I, you know, some people on the sidelines are we're trying to do this forever. Right. Oh, well, the, the story about the field is, can I give you this story? Sure. Go for it. Absolutely. Okay. This, this is your, is your time. time coach. Okay. So, you know, we we literally played on the swamp, the, the far end of the end zone is where the hog river is, but that was covered up by the, the park river was covered up by the army Corps of engineers. Well, when they put in the original new field, the grass field, they put the wrong piping underneath, so it got all clogged. So I would lit one time. I went out there to the end zone to talk to the team. We had a timeout. When I turned around to walk off, my shoe got stuck in the mud, and I walked off and it, and, and, and actually pulled my shoe off. We had literally six inches of mud. So we had a really rainy season, 2003, 2004, right around there. So finally, we said, we're going to have a meeting about this field. I said, okay, well, we, this is what we need for funding. And I think back then we could have got a brand new turf field for maybe $600,000. Mm, okay. Then. So I went, I proceeded to go to meetings about this new field in 2004, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, up to about, about 2016. They called a meeting and I said, I'm not going. I'm not going. It's, there's, there's no point here. I'm, I'm tired of this conversation. It was the last day of school in 2018. Uh, a couple of teachers are going down to the uh, to the local pub over here to get a drink before we leave for summer. And I run into majority leader Matt Ritter. Um, Matt Ritter 
was my student when I first started teaching at Noah Webster School from kindergarten to fifth grade. Well, he sees me and comes running at me and about to tackle me. Then we, I said, sit down, Matt, let's talk. So we had a talk. I said, Matt, I mean, I got I have a couple of years left here. It's a coach just going to coach in this swamp for the rest of his career. And that's when Malloy was on his way out. And he said, well, I got a meeting with Malloy. He's got some bond money. He told me to bring me my two best two or three bonds. I'm going to put this number one on my list. So I literally text this Matt every day. Matt, what's up? Matt, what's up? All summer. So it was that, that the same August, that we're just starting football practice. I'm sitting here at my desk. I see my phone ring and I see Matt Ritter. And I'm like, this is either terrible news or I'm going to be a real happy man here now. I pick up the phone. I said, Matt, do not break my heart, please. He goes, coach, you needed a million. I got you a million. Wow. Yeah, it was in the August of 2018. Took a little while to get organized, but, you know, we have the field now. And then hopefully at some point we're going to get the lights in the track. And, uh, uh, and you know, that was one of the reasons, like, I'm going to play on this field. I'm not retiring until I at least get one year. I've been waiting a long time for this. Yeah. So, and you got one of your former the win. Couple, one of your former students coming through for you. I love it. You know, you look back, that's like, you know, most sad. It must be the most satisfying thing when you see, you know, your, your kids and your uh, students just go on and do great things. Uh, um, you know, I, I, we, we, you, you coach and you teach as long as you have it. You, there must be a few of them, I guess. Uh, well, right? we've had, we've had 11 division one players come out of Hartford high under my tutelage. We've had three guys um, in the NFL. Um, Brian Sanford being the longest played five years in the NFL, four years for Oakland. And uh, I mean, four years for um, the Browns and then one year for uh, Oakland. Uh, Eli Joseph uh, was on the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers practice squad for a year. Pina Joseph had the Packers, but that was the strike year. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have any rookie camp. And I think that hurt him. Um, but Eli Joseph now, who was who UConn wouldn't give a scholarship to. And I told that recruiter right to his face. I said, Eli Joseph will be the captain of UConn football. There's no question about that. <laughs> he goes to Temple, is the captain of Temple football. Yeah. Uh, uh, all ECA, ECAC his senior year, four-time all-academic ECAC, and, and, and spent a year on the Pittsburgh Steelers practice squad. And now is the leading real estate uh, person in the greater Hartford area. Yeah, oh, look at that. Yeah. Remember him. <laughs> but UConn passed on him. Uh, they they pass on a lot of guys. Yeah. yeah, but you know you mentioned these these players who who have gone on to do great things, and you know you have a lot of time to to look back on. So I, I want to ask, like, what's what's your favorite memory? Like, if you could pinpoint one assistant coaching, teaching, head coaching, one moment that you're just like that was my favorite. Oh. And and I will say this because it's already a great moment. The win on Saturday on the field that you helped get built. You cannot pick that one because yeah. obviously that one's great. And that's an easy out for you. I think. Um, oh, God. You don't have to call it the best moment, but you yeah, can call it just a, like great a great moment. I think one of my greatest moment, just a moment on the field was we we're playing at South Windsor High School. And I had an all-state kicker named Chuck, Chuck Gallagher. Um, and he played and he ended up kicking at Southern. So we're playing. South Windsor, it's a pretty close game, but almost halftime. We get stopped. And I said, and I said, oh, Chuck's been cooking well. Go out there and kick the field goal. So he runs out there. We're going to kick the field goal. And uh, um, my coach says, my assistant coach says, coach, you sure? I said, yeah, he was hitting them from 45, 40, uh, from 40 yards easy. It's only a 43-yard field goal. He said, coach, I think that's 53 yards. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he can make it. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, my God, 53 yards. But he boots it and it goes up and, it, and the announcer is doing play by play, which drives me crazy during the game like they some of them do. And he's going and that kick is up and it's it's good. <laughs> and we were going crazy. So that ended up being at that time was the second longest field goal in Connecticut history behind, I believe, Rico Brogna, but not a kid from Hall has it. Right. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, was, yeah no, uh, that was an awesome moment. Uh, um, and uh, another funny moment was again against South Windsor. We're down, we're down uh, one point, so we decide to go for two to see if we can win the game. We come out in a formation with two tight ends, three guys in the backfield, and a flanker, 12 guys on the field. They don't see it. We run the play and get the two-point conversion and win the game. 
<laughs> I'm looking at the film and I'm like, uh, that's the that's the owl special formation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say, you know, you bring up Chuck Alger. I went to college with him. He was a roommate of my friend from home. Really? Yeah. Once you yeah. said the name, I looked him up. I was like, why do I know him? I, I went to Southern at that time as well. So that's yeah. small world. Yes. He's a master, he's, a, he's a master sergeant in uh, uh, in the army now. I just saw oh, him wow. a couple days ago. Yeah, he, and he trains uh, MPs and and in in, in 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 how to do intelligence work now. Down oh wow, Texas. that's awesome! I haven't seen him since maybe I was a freshman, but yeah. <laughs> it's a and, small and, world. Yeah, and I think you know the first year I took over, um, my first game as a head coach was against uh, Jack Cochran at Bloomfield, and he beat me seventy-two to zip. Oof, that's right. And I remember I, that. I was playing a bunch of sophomores, all those guys, Peanut Joseph, uh, Brian was a junior, uh, Sanford. And, 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 you know, we just weren't ready for that. And, you know, we, and, and, and no, actually it was Bobby Gibson who was the head coach because Jack had just left. And okay. Bobby was trying to show Jack that. Right. Yeah. It was 20, 2003. Yeah. He was, yeah, it it was, was shadow. Yeah, right. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Right. And he was, and Jack was there watching the game. So it, that, that, that was the thing. And, uh, and I talked to Bobby later and he realized how wrong that was and, yeah. and, and things like that. But going from that year, two and nine, and I know because I'm coming over from Buckley, all these Hartford I and I'm looking at me sideways going, oh, this Buckley guy. But the next year we go seven and three and make the playoffs. And the next year we go nine and one and don't make the playoffs, by the way. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, that's when I knew we had, because that was the four team system that we had to change something because, I mean, I've been, I think, eight and two twice and didn't get in. Nine, and, you know, like you can win eight football games. You should have a shot. Right. You should get in. No, no, no. Yeah. I totally agree with that. 100%. Yeah. And when you talk to guys from Pennsylvania, Texas, and they go, yeah, I went eight and two. They go, how are you doing the playoffs? I said, we didn't make it. They go, what? I made it. I was seven and three. I was six and four. I mean, not I that go, we didn't. I could go all day about the, about my playoffs philosophy. I know you guys have heard it, you know, not nauseam. I'm sure I've been, you know, I've been talked about in meetings and uh, always saying this. That's again. okay, though. But, you know, we all we're all passionate about the game of, of football. And look, it looks like it's got given you so much. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention your daughter. Was it Aaron who who was a kicker for for Frank Robinson third over there at uh, at Hall? I mean, you have another daughter, but uh, but that must have been really special to have her playing football too. What you know what? She was a soccer player, and uh, she comes to me uh, in the spring of going of a junior year and says, "Dad, I think I want to play football next year." And I'm like, "Aaron, you're like 120 pounds and five foot two. I, I, I don't." She goes, "I think I want to be the kicker." And I knew she had a pretty strong foot. I said, "Okay." I brought some balls home. We went down the hall. Taught her the method. She was booting. I said, you got to go see Coach Robinson now. He's going to want you to lift. She went to all the weightlifting, did everything. And and uh, she ended up getting a job. And I think she, now she has the um, – among. she's in the Connecticut record book for yeah. percentage of kick – you know, percentage of making kicks in, 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 uh, for a season uh, for a girl, I think, or whatever. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, she she was was like, in, she's in there, yeah. Yeah, she was like 31 for 36 her senior year. And I said, any high school coach in Connecticut would take that percentage of kicking in a heartbeat i was i was two for six this week so i i could definitely relate to that and you know and you can probably look this up on youtube like she went to a a um a, a concert you saw that yeah oh yeah that was with michael, um, michael Bublé. michael Bublé, who doesn't love michael Bublé? yeah she can belt a tune that's what i was gonna say but go yeah. ahead coach. And she took that mic and sang in front of twenty five thousand people at madison square garden aaron Bellucci. With at last. Oh, goodness gracious. And I said, Was you nervous? She goes, well, yeah, but once I started singing, you know, I've done this before. I'm like, that's a question. Uh, yeah, just casually done this before in front of 25,000 people. Yeah, casual. I, I so. Casual. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That And then she actually kicked a game against me. She kicked three extra points against me in a game. Uh, all played at Hartford High at Hartford High. And accidentally, one of my kids, when they were rushing her, hit her out of the shoulder, she fell down. He came sprinting off the field. I'm sorry, coach. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the first, she made the first one. She kicked the first extra point against us. And all my kids are like slapping her high five. I'm like, no, no, we're not. <laughs> after the game, her. after yeah. the game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not that happy she made it. But <laughs> I, I think they beat us in a fairly close game. Um, 
And uh, but you know that that that's a big moment in her life. She loves it. She still wears her jersey, and she's definitely a big pro, a football fan. So that was that was a, a great moment in my life, and that I got the and in fact to, to, to coach her during the All Star games. Yeah, I think that's another huge thing in my career, getting to coach in all those All Star games. I mean, I was the head coach too, but being an assistant coach and getting to coach uh, um, oh. Uh, the safety from Manchester was in the NFL now. Uh, went to Princeton. Oh, uh, the tight end. What yeah. was his name? Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. What is his name? I can't remember. Uh, Seth. Um, yes. What an awesome guy. Val. Seth something. Yeah. Subby. Subby. Oh, Duval. Duval? Duval. Yeah, Seth Duval. Yeah. Subby from, Man- uh, from uh, Cheshire who went to um, uh, uh, Yale. Subby. Uh, Seba- um, Sebastian. Little. Sebastian. Who was the most awesome kid I've ever met in my life? Uh, Latrell Dobbs, getting to coach all those, getting to coach all these great players from Connecticut and meet them in the All Star game, plus all the incredible coaches I met: John Ferrazzi, Andy, Sean Marinin, Jason Martinez. I mean, just getting to know all those guys and learning from them was it, it, that those 15 years coaching those All Star games, you know, was uh, incredible. The, of, of all the awesome people that I got to meet which is how I got started working for the uh, CHSCA. Yeah. It's been a full career. I have to say that, you know, especially after being a assistant coach for 23 years, right? You're thinking, is this ever going to happen? Cause I'm thinking Grant Martin's going to retire in a year now. Well, he doesn't retire. And then Jack, I'm teaching at Harvard high. Then Jack decides to retire. I take the job and then Grant Martin retires <laughs> the, the, the very next year. Yep. And that, that is my only loss to Buckley in 17 years was to Graham Martin, my first game against him. Wow. But, you know, after that happened, uh, 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 when Graham was retiring, my boss downtown came and said, hey, Harry, you can go back home if you want. But I knew I had, you know, the Joseph brothers. I had Brian Sanford. I said, I think I'm home. Yeah. Well, I want to stay That's here. amazing. That's well, amazing. Hopefully, you know, the right move. Yeah. Well, hopefully maybe you want to, I don't know if we're going to do the all-star game, but maybe you should coach it one last time this year. And then you can let me call like two plays. I, I, all you, I want. You can call them all. <laughs> I just, we'll just run a little five wide. We'll run. Uh, if anyone played like blitz, like the bomb or, or four verticals from that. And that's how I know how to call. Plays. That. They, they, that'd be a great idea. Oh, that's man. the reporters we, call it. There it is. Don't Bully give him versus any Pugwaga. ideas. Coach. Come on. Oh, well, that's his own idea. Don't give it. Oh. All right. Well, we can talk all day, coach. This has been great. I know you got, you're busy. We're busy. It's football season. We're really happy. Congratulations on your first win. You guys got a long way to go, but it looks like you, like someone on the sideline of your team uh, on the, on your sideline said, it looks like we might have a team here. So long yeah. way to go, but good luck in this final year. It's, I'm sure it's going to be a great one. I we appreciate it and happy retirement going down the road. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Maybe if you win a state championship or something, right? Coach? Oh, yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> congrats right. coach we yeah. really appreciate it and good luck we'll see you again this rest of the year but congrats on uh on the happy retirement okay thank you guys for having me i appreciate it always harry bellucci everybody so pete that was harry bellucci that was an amazing interview i i thought harry would be great and he's just the guy who's he loves football and it's clear that uh, it's been football has been really good it's loved him back Pete. yes it was it was i mean i love when we can get coaches you know who've been around for such a long time the stories that they tell are, are just incredible but i do think i'm gonna hold him two percent chance he's coming back two huh? i asked for five he said he could give me two i think this is it man yeah i think no, me i think you can probably see him on a sideline something he might be like an assistant coach as long listen running a high school football program is hard you know, and if you do it for as long as he had, you know, and it, it's not easy for the for a city school like Hartford Public. You know, you want to say like Buchanan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, Lou Marinelli has his own problems. But, you know, there's a lot of things that Lou Marinelli doesn't have to do. And there's a lot of things that Harry Bellucci does have to do uh, as the, the run, as the leader of that program. So, you know, I, you talk about head coaches who become assistants like Jeff Roy Shelton. He's like, oh, the world is I can just coach. I don't have to worry about all the other you know, nonsense that's go with, with being a head coach. And for Harry to be able to do it as long as he did. He was an assistant for a long time coaching a state championship game. I mean, he's, he's pretty much done all. He's checked all the boxes uh, pretty much in the state of Connecticut. Um, so uh, we appreciate Harry coming on and yeah. wish him a good season. I don't I don't think this is the last we will see of Harry. I think he he loves connecting and being a part of, you know, 
young athletes' lives and seeing them do go on and do great things. So this won't be the last we hear or see of Harry Bellucci. Heck, he might even be on the West Haven baseball staff in the spring. So who knows? I mean, well, if they play in in, uh, in Greater Hartford, maybe. maybe you know. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, so Ronnie's going to make that drive Hartford. down. Ronnie's going to make that. They could carpool. I don't know how... Uh... I don't know how Ronnie Leno is going to, you know, handle driving, uh, you know, commuting to West Harvard to cover West Haven or to, to coach West Haven. We'll, we shall see. So lots of stuff going on this week, P. We got the pick section already out. You know, you can join us on that second podcast to see how we did in the picks. It, 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 spoiler alert. If you haven't seen it, we did not do well. Pete and I or Jacobs, but especially Pete. So go check that out right now. So, Pete, that's another podcast for this week. Uh, God, I can't believe we're already into week two. We're, we're already into holiday. week two. We're already looking forward to week three. By the time we, you know, before we know, it'll be Thanksgiving. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be going where the whole time go. Yeah. That is the most amazing thing. It was like it took forever to get football back. Now that we got football back, it's going to go fine. like this. It's yep. going so we're just here. We're just along for the ride. We hope it's a good one. Anyway, that'll do it for me for a meat grinder podcast this week for Peter Pagraga. I'm Sean Patrick Bowley. We'll see you next time. Love you.